Well, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, really excited to have um, uh, Dr. Ash Ashilafu with us today. Um, he is a uh, absolute leader in molecular imaging, and um, he's here today to, to talk a little bit about that. Um, <clears throat> Uh, please remember to use the Q&A feature. There'll be about uh, 10 minutes of, of, of Q&A at the end. Um, Sam Ashilafu is, is the Michelle M. Terbogosi and Professor of Radiology, and he also has appointments in medicine, biochemistry, uh, and molecular biophysics, as well as biomedical engineering. He's vice chair for innovation at the Mallinckrodt and is a chief of optical radiology and co-leads the oncology imaging program at the Siteman Cancer Center. As a, um, he, is, he is truly known for his molecular imaging of human diseases, but primarily in cancer and, and, and portable imaging devices, uh, goggles and other nanotechnology areas. He's published over 300 scientific papers, been continuously NIH funded and has 63 US patents. So it's a real pleasure to have him. He has, you know, obviously been a leader. He's he's received over twenty local, national, international honors for his work, uh, and I'm really, really glad that he accepted our offer today. So, uh, Sam, I'll let you um, get started. Thank you very much, Evan. Um, truly a pleasure to be here. Um, should I share my screen again? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, can you see that? Yeah. Perfect. I see it. So it's truly really a pleasure to be here today. And thank you, uh, Dr. Rosenthal, for this um, kind invitation um, and the organizers. Here at Washington University, we are required to make this disclosure about um, our financial conflict of interest. Um, uh, this is just another way of saying that I, um, I'm involved in a lot of things, but that doesn't make me rich. Um, I like to acknowledge uh, some of the people that really did the work I'm going to talk about upfront, uh, because typically we run out of time and um, I want to acknowledge Suma Mwandal, um, Christine O'Brien, Leo Shmulovich, and uh, Shao. A lot of them work heavily on instrumentation. Uh, I also want to acknowledge Karen Wosu and Zoha Nuzinov and Alex are the you know, software engineers here that are making things work. They are both professors in physics department. And, and uh, Christopher Malone is our uh, interventional radiologist translating a lot of our work into the clinic. And we have a lot of chemists and, and biologists that really uh, allow us to move forward. Uh, again, I want to acknowledge upfront uh, many people that collaborate with us across the different parts of the country. Um, and we are really delighted to have them as team members. Uh, the lab, uh, optical radiology lab, is multidisciplinary in nature, you know, has about 11 faculty members now. and. Uh, sometimes over 80 members as a whole. And so each one played different roles in, 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 in our progress so far. I want to acknowledge Joe Colvert, who is really a very close friend and collaborator, and especially uh, Monica Shokin that uh, worked closely with our team uh, to make things work. I remember many years ago um, when I used to give this talk on uh, optical imaging, which is an area I work in, um, molecular imaging in the 90s and, and early 2000s really took off as, as a, a branch of uh, imaging that um, is geared towards interrogating tissues uh, in such a way that um, had never been done before. Um, but even with that progress at the early stages, uh, I would always say that X-ray is always busy. Um, there are many people in radiology department that come in for X-rays. Uh, magnetic resonance imaging, as you know, um, is really exciting area of research and 
and clinical practice with quite a lot of functional imaging taking place there. Nuclear imaging, I call it, it has a home specific types of interventions that are being done uh, guided by nuclear imaging. In fact, that is the mother of um, molecular imaging, as we say, it's, uh, uh, it has always been there, but then seen in a different way. Ultrasound, always used for specific applications, but um, uh, it, at least it has a room. And I used to say something like, Optical imaging is basically cute, but homeless. Uh, there weren't radiologists engaged and it was hard to find ways of translating them into the clinic because there were very few trained um, uh, physicians that be, uh, worked in the field of uh, optical molecular imaging. Um, and that changed when uh, one of yours uh, really jumped into the scene and became a leading pioneer in the field and I, I cannot talk about molecular imaging without mentioning Sam Gambier, um, um, who we all know is a, a leading and a pioneer in, in this field that distinguished himself in so many ways, a visionary indeed. And we were all affected by his loss. And to today that uh, resonates and is something that, that we just can't get over it. Uh, this was a picture we took in 2018. I think that was the last uh, year I did meet with him. Um, we met several times, but we don't take photos. And so this is where we had the Distinguished Investigators Award together in Chicago at RSN, uh, RSNA. And um, we also met in Washington, D.C. for our uh, uh, Centers of Cancer and Technology Excellence, which we are both PIs on. Um, it's really a big loss for all of us. And um, I do not think any words or even our words uh, will be sufficient to symbolize what he represents for the community. He's truly a giant that supersedes um, not only molecular imaging, but health, uh, health as a whole, as you all know very well. And I hope that we can weaponize the uh, multi-dimensional discoveries he made uh, during his lifetime in the field of imaging and therapy uh, to make cancer history. And that will be the best honor we can give him as we walk towards that direction. As you know, you, you at Stanford has one of the most enviable uh, molecular imaging program that is really exciting and, and, and you stay is the benchmark for every other institution. Um, uh, here at Washington University, uh, we did establish uh, something that mimics it a little bit, uh, the optical radiology lab that consists of quite a lot of um, scientists, chemists, biologists, physicists, and engineers, and clinicians all coming together to tackle uh, problems. Uh, this lab was somewhat modeled after, after the MIP. Uh, it goes beyond optical. Uh, it involves also multimodal platforms. Um, but of course, your program is on steroids. Uh, we, we can't even approach that. Uh, so we have moved forward to then come to the point where we establish all this um, to allow us now at Washington University, our program is integrated with multiple areas of um, intervention, uh, such as um, ophthalmology, neurology, dermatology, uh, internal medicine, especially in oncology area, surgery as well. So we have programs going on there, different areas. Uh, and I will talk a little bit about uh, my work in in the area of um, uh, oncology, interface between radiology, oncology, and surgery. Uh, one reason we like this program very much, uh, oncologic imaging, is that now you can do macroscopic imaging um, with different resolution. Breast cancer imaging is routine. Uh, skin lesions, um, endoscopic uh, enabled interventions are now all accessible to the optical imaging methods. Um, in fact, there is a new device that can image the whole body, um, which is very good uh, as you start looking at a variety of um, uh, lesions that are not too deep into the tissue. But then you can take the signals if you use a contrast agent uh, that's fluorescent in this case, 
to start looking at histology in a different light um, and to guide biopsy. The heterogeneity of cancer can always be seen uh, as in this case where um, you can visualize that all the cells are not alike. And these imaging signals will tell you that if you take a sample for analysis from one area versus the other, you are going to get different results. So it allows us to then go in, get the information, look at cellular imaging and genomic imaging as a whole. And that's why we are excited about the basic science that then can lead to clinical translation and back and forth uh, aided by optical imaging approaches. So today I'm just going to focus on a small area of what we are doing. Um, I will give you an outline of our new strategy to uh, target cancer uh, in such a way that we are not limited by um, the express receptors, which can vary quite a lot um, based on the time, uh, and instead fo focus on pathophysiologic conditions that will allow us to capture a broadband um, level of cancer um, types available. I will also discuss um, our cancer viewing uh, glasses, uh, which is uh, uh, a head, um, uh, a wearable device that the surgeons can use to visualize cancer in real time in the operating room, allowing them to hopefully one day make it a high throughput process uh, without leaving uh, residual lesions behind. Um, they, I will give you a couple of examples of our clinical studies. It's ongoing right now, so I will let you know where we are and the challenges we face in the and then it end with um, uh, concluding statements. So all of you know, um, uh, one of the areas that Sam Gambier has really tried to work was pushing our detection to much earlier than what is known today. Um, because it's clear that if cancer is detected early, um, it's very is they are curable many at times. Um, but the problem is that most of them are coming in really at the late stages when um, it's absolutely um, difficult to cure and creates a lot of problems along the way. So in that case, uh, the intervention, the only curable one for most of them right now um, or that has that potential is surgery. Um, and this was um, one of the images we took when I, I went to uh, Fudan uh, Liver Institute in Shanghai, China. Uh, and, and here is a patient that uh, was diagnosed with um, liver cancer, HCC. And, and this patient had um, a tumor that you can easily visualize. And when you open up the patient, um, you can quickly see clearly this football-sized uh, tumor in the, in the liver. So in this case, it's very easy to visualize, to remove uh, without the aid of much uh, technologies. Um, however, we did see another patient also. In this case, um, uh, you can see the diffuse nature of the tumor and, and in the operating room. Uh, this is what you see. And it's extremely difficult to know where the tumor is, where, um, uh, what are the boundaries, and how am I sure I've removed them. And these are cases where actually you need an intervention to be able to address it. And, and you hope your surgeon is well versed in the area and to speculate where the cancer is. Of course, there are other areas such as a random biopsy of lymph nodes uh, in breast cancer patients, in melanoma patients, just to figure out if they are positive or negative. And, I think in this current uh, uh, era, we should be able to interrogate those nodes intraoperatively and only remove them if necessary, as opposed to uh, creating a lot of morbidities associated with um, random removal of lymph nodes that end up being negative at the end of it all. And one of the areas, of course, that a lot of uh, people focus on is um, uh, the negative margin and to make sure that we do not have any uh, tumors or microscopic lesions that are um, uh, left behind after surgery that necessitates second surgeries. So with all that, uh, the bottom line is that we want to really 
uh, move away from subjecting the visual decisions to that leads to variable outcomes to more um, uh, objective way of, of, of um, surgical interventions. Hopefully through this effort, um, it does not depend on your, the outcome will not depend on your zip code uh, where you live, but instead on um, equal playing fields that these technologies can provide. So we have to address the following questions. Um, how can we eliminate gaze work from surgery and then prevent local relapse, especially in the case of brain tumors where we are now moving into as well, uh, as well as selectively kill cancer cells. To do that, we have um, in our program, these three strategic uh, approach uh, uh, that we use. Um, clearly, we want to tag the tumor cells um, selectively in such a way that we can then see them. Uh, we develop devices, uh, simplified versions of what's available today so that it can be seen in real time and at point of care settings. Uh, it doesn't have to be at uh, advanced clinical centers. And we also figure out a way to eradicate them selectively in such a way that um, uh, those that cannot be removed can then you switch the wavelength of light to eradicate them. Towards that goal, the tagging was really one of our initial uh, 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 areas of research where we looked at a variety of, of regulated uh, targeting agent, uh, uh, biomarkers in cancer, and then divide, de uh, designed uh, molecular imaging agents to target them selectively. Um, well, one of our inspiration in the early 19, in the late 90s and early 2000s was the approval of um, uh, this small uh, peptide-based um, imaging agent um, that is uh, octreotide, uh, octreotide, in fact, is a combination of in the 111 radio labeled uh, peptide that um, was approved for the first time for imaging uh, neuroendocrine tumors. And, and what we did was take exactly the same model. In these days, we couldn't actually <laughs> buy any imaging, optical imaging device off the shelf. And so uh, we have to build this ourselves, uh, uh, Rick Dosha and our team, uh, and, and created a potential for us to then switch the radio level with the uh, near infrared probe that allows us to demonstrate for the first time uh, this whole body imaging using near infrared uh, small peptide molecules. And, and this really launched that whole area where today uh, I, I, you see quite a lot of clinical translational efforts using materials, uh, small peptide or small molecule labeled uh, near infrared uh, contrast agents for clinical application. And so we did look at many other types, including the integrin and showing that um, you can detect them in animal models and on and on and on. We kept creating these molecules, but the problem was challenges in translating them into the clinic. Um, because uh, unlike drugs, uh, as you will see in the next slide, um, unlike drugs that, of course, from the dollar perspective, there's a lot of return on investment, it's not the same for imaging agents um, because the market for it is not that high. And if you start creating different types for different cancers, it will always end up in the research lab or possibly just a phase one clinical trials. So a lot of these materials are made, but very few make it past phase one clinical trials. Our whole question then was to start focusing more uh, on different approaches. Instead of looking at these intractable um, molecular signatures or biomarkers of cancer that keep changing from cancer type to cancer type, even within, within the same tumor type, well, we started looking at the variety of uh, common pathophysiologic pathways. We, we developed um, some of the imaging approaches uh, using pH sensors uh, and um, also using the redox potential that we know is different between cancer and non-cancer. And all of them provided us an insight that we can target a variety of cancer types using one imaging agent. 
And so well, in working in that area, just to, uh, not to go into the details of all that took place, uh, we found that there was um, quite a lot of, um, uh, we discovered this small molecule that is called LS301. Um, it's, a, it's an octapeptide that is uh, cyclized to using a disulfide bond. And one of the disulfide bond is um, D16. The other one is L16 to enhance, uh, to stabilize this, uh, to enhance the serum stability of the molecules to which we attach a near infrared fluorophore that we call the cypate. And together we created this nice molecule that internalized, internalized in a variety of cells. And, and that allowed us to then um, explore how well it, it can go into the tumors. And in screening the molecules, we discovered that um, it really internalized a lot of cancer types. Um, uh, that we explored in our place, uh, including the brain tumors, the colon cancer, uh, ACC, as well as a variety of breast tumors. And so we started wondering, in fact, this delayed our papers for a long time because we didn't understand the exact mechanism by which it does uh, its work, um, what enhances the uptake. After several studies, um, we did discover that um, this material actually binds to activated uh, NXN A2. Um, as you will see here using a binding studies, um, here is the phosphorylated NXN A2. This is NXN A2 that's uh, inactive. And here is NXN A2, uh, A3, and different types of NXN. It has uh, picomole selectivity for it. And that accounted for one of the things we are seeing because um, uh, many of these proliferating tumor cells upregulate the expression of activate phosphorylate and xn A2 um, uh, as a part of the whole um, uh, chronic inflammatory milieu of the tumor tissue. And, and so here is, uh, we then look for a cancer cell that um, we look for a cancer cell that does not express an XNA2. And we show that if you incubate it with LS301, there's hardly any uptake. However, um, one of the exciting things is that when you transfer that cell line with GFP or YFP and XNA2, as shown here in green, uh, you quickly notice that incubation with LS301 now starts being taken up, shown here in red color. And, and that was very interesting uh, in, in the sense that the cancer cells, as you will see, that do not express um, this uh, next in A2 will not take it up. And, and when you merge it, you will find that selectivity. And so this was very encouraging for us to show that um, we identified what makes it go to a variety of cells, uh, cancer types. And then we then extended that whole approach to asking, um, do tumor cells really upregulate um, an XNA2 expression? Um, yeah, we did find it uh, looking at, we, we explored so many of them, uh, different tumor tissues, of course, to different levels, but they are always there and they are spread correlated well with an XNA2. Then we extended that to cancer cells, um, uh, uh, human breast uh, tumor cells. We've looked more than uh, different types. Of, I, think, I think we have about 15 of them right now. Um, here you are showing that in tumor types, you can see the enhancement of uh, PNXNA2 um, uh, in the tumors relative to uh, the same thing with the annexing A2, but in healthy tissue, uh, such as uh, normal breast tissue, um, you can find the expression of annexing A2, the inactive form of uh, this protein, but really um, they do not activate loss of, uh, of, of this protein, uh, which is normal due to lower metabolic activity and events. So this allowed us then to start looking at the distribution pattern, the spread, and what enhances it. We know that uh, it co-localizes with areas rich in calcium, for example, 
and, and also that we can be able to see um, the spread in different parts of the tumor, um, uh, which was encouraging. But more impressively, uh, we did find that it does not bind to uh, uh, fibroblasts, normal fibroblasts. But when you go incubate the fibroblasts with tumors, you start seeing a lot of the transfer of annexin A2 into the fibroblast and then enhance the expression. All of a sudden, it starts taking up the uh, LS301 as well. So this has become a very good marker of calves, uh, a way to detect them as well, associated closely with, uh, with the tumor cells. Um, that combination actually is giving us what we call the amplification system, allowing us to detect cancer with high sensitivity, um, with a lot of uh, the co-localization of, of this agent with um, uh, uh, to the cancer and immediately uh, closely associated uh, tumor cells, uh, especially towards the boundary of the tumors. And, and this is very encouraging. And having found that we, we, we detect uh, also, it binds to arginase uh, one positive macrophages uh, that are also very closely associated with tumor cells. And, and the whole thing uh, supports the signal amplification we observe uh, even currently in the clinic. So um, one way of applying it amongst many that we're exploring, uh, we talk about the image-guided system that we have, is to use it to guide surgical resection of tumors. As you know, the optical method is very attractive for a variety of reasons. Um, you can now use it in the operating room without worrying about radiation, and it's highly sensitive as well. You can detect very small lesions. So one of the things we ended up doing is, um, as you know, um, there are so many devices today that's been uh, 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 developed to help with uh, detecting these signals, uh, these molecular probes, especially in the near infrared uh, uh, wavelengths of light. Um, a lot, they could be standalone or they are handheld devices. All of them today um, are being used in the clinic. So um, you have the at Stanford, uh, Dr. Rosenthal, uh, who is really uh, an icon, a world leader in this field. Um, and I thank him for the way he has pushed um, this whole area forward uh, to the point that now clinical translation is almost routine or expected. And uh, here is the case where you use an antibody labeled uh, fluorophore that emits in the near infrared for head and neck tumors. And you can quickly see the regions where the cancer is lighting up clearly without any uh, uh, or, uh, ambiguity there. Um, He's moving quite a lot of this into the clinical trials right now, and we look forward to his final report about the outcomes of those studies um, in, uh, that's ongoing. And um, because these antibodies are very large, um, um, one of the approaches that uh, another group is using, um, Brian Pogue, is to be able to look at um, uh, mini bodies, uh, uh, small antibodies that can be used uh, uh, to target tumor cells uh, uh, effectively. And he has translated that into the clinic as well, showing that this antibody, small fragment of antibody, can actually be able to uh, localize in tumor cells and with very good signal to noise ratio. Um, one of, if you start noticing uh, the trend here, one of the challenges we are all faced with which we hope to address is the extent of disease. How far will you go as a surgeon to resect the tumors uh, based on the signals we are seeing? Uh, this is an area we are, uh, we are welcome to collaborate with us and many others uh, working hard on using um, machine learning to help guide all these um, um, uh, thresholding methods to detect we are the limit of uh, diseases and to guide resection accurately. Uh, many of those devices, as you know, they are really complex and um, uh, uh, where they may be simple, but they are disruptive. And, and you have to look at where the fluorescence is and every other thing, and you require a second person or somebody to 
help direct the signal, the imaging device so that the surgeons can visualize that. And what we try because of our interest in global health is to simplify the whole process. And that's when we decided to work on this cancer vision uh, uh, viewing glasses. And that allows the surgeon to wear them and then project all the images right into the visual field of the surgeon. And to accomplish that, one of the things we've done is to um, miniaturize this whole process. It's where you have a light, um, um, the illumination source, which is a, a, a way to activate the, the fluorophores in the body so that you can see. And we tried various ways to accomplish this. Um, uh, the, uh, Ron Liang at Arizona uh, University uh, played a huge role uh, in, in working with us in this area. And at the end, we found that really we want to leave the surgical lights on. And one way to accomplish this is to put this 3M filter over the surgical light to eradicate the spray near infrared light from, from the surgical light. And that took care of it you know, after going through a lot of engineering to solve that problem. And the second place is the imaging model where we develop nice uh, near infrared sensors and, and filter and use beam, a beam splitting methods to, to collect both the near infrared and the visible light that's then processed and, uh, and sent back to the head mounted device. Um, Victor Grove, who is now at Urbana Champagne, and really played a huge role, I uh, can't thank him enough, in helping us uh, address these issues. And then the question I did raise is how do you know when to stop? How do you know the signal is uh, important and relevant? And so we come up with a very ways of doing dynamic fluorescence thresholding. Uh, that allows us to then uh, segment the images in a way that uh, when you get to the bottom, when the, uh, the uh, tumor to background is very low, then you will be able to stop and know that you reach that bottom line. So this becomes a guide in a uh, uh, real-time image processing system. Um, so we've developed a variety of them. Um, uh, this, uh, imaging devices can be video see-through that allows us to apply it um, in the case of endoscopic applications and the optical see-through that allows you to use it as if you are wearing your normal glasses and then uh, just project the near infrared and co-localize with visible light uh, to show you where you are. And we've incorporated a lot of light sensors to dim or brighten the, uh, the display and distance sensors to allow you to track the surgeons when they move back and forth so that you'll be able to correct for that uh, variation. And so this is a simple illustration of the whole process. Um, an animal that has tumor, you inject LS301, it lights up in the tumor, which you can see, you resect that uh, uh, LS301, you inject it, um, it lights up the tumor, which you can see, and then you carefully resect that cancer and after you're done, if there's anything left, uh, you re scale it back again, as you will see in this case. And that rescaling allows the small lesions that we are invisible in the presence of the large ones to become visible for resection. And then the auto stop of the thresholding takes place when the tumor to background ratio draws below one to 1.5. So, um, in real time, so this is it again, a simple way, LS31 injected, looking at the whole body, it clears quickly through the liver, and then the tumor is present here, and that whole resection process can occur even within a few hours, um, uh, an hour or two uh, immediately after injection. And this, uh, you can use it as a small animal imaging device as well, um, as using it um, in the clinic. So here is that residual tumor that you couldn't see, and then you can go ahead and take care of it. So in the operating room, we started translating these to look at uh, various types of cancer types. Uh, we are looking at breast, uh, and, uh, head and neck tumors, uh, with Dr. Jackson, pancreatic uh, cancer with Dr. Field, melanoma, as well as breast. So, 
Here is uh, our surgeon, Dr. Julie Magin Taller, who is a breast on uh, uh, surgical oncologist. Um, that's really a wonderful person to work with, highly collaborative and patient as we go through all this. And the advantage of the goggle device is that you can see exactly what the surgeon is seeing. It can be projected right there on the screen for others to see if needed. Or you can use it as part of your lecture series where uh, surgical trainees can be in a different room and guide them through exactly what's going on in real time. And with that, then visualization becomes practical. Uh, and here is um, uh, Dr. Ryan Fields uh, looking at uh, the lymph node of a, of a melanoma patient and becomes very easy to detect after injection of L ICG and just an ingrain into this patient and you can quickly see it and which we are now using uh, because it's very easy, it's simple and can be quickly uh, detected. The interesting thing is that we always think about um, these fluorescent probes as being superficial, uh, but this is a more than three centimeter deep um, uh, node that wasn't readily visible and could have easily been missed. Um, but uh, there was a blob showing that a signal, a bright signal was deep into the, the, the tissue and uh, the surgeons went ahead and uh, Magintola looked deeper and was able to find this uh, sentinel lymph node um, that was really bright and, and was able to be removed. So um, it's a technique that could be used for that application without problems. Uh, same thing with the head and neck tumors. Uh, we are right now, uh, Dr. Ryan, uh, uh, Dr. Ryan Jackson is, um, a, uh, is using it for um, looking at head and neck tumors, um, easily to identify the nodes and, and be able to resect them or remove them for further studies down the line. So if there is positive margin, um, this can easily be visualized. Um, we are seeing it projected right there on the surface of the excised cancer uh, uh, tumors and without any uh, ambiguity around it. But the advantage is that you can go back to the cavity. This is a little bit uh, um, um, uh, enlarged for visualization, but you can go back to the cavity and identify areas of residual fluorescence and then remove them. So one area this is going to be useful uh, moving forward is this shave margin. Uh, that is now the standard of care for breast cancer resection, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, William Gillanders will be uh, working in this field, uh, in this area with our team, which we're excited about. Um, so I did show you this image at the start. Uh, how do you identify where the tumor is? After injection, for us to do this study, this was carried out uh, with our coll collaborators at Fudan uh, uh, Liver Institute in China, Shanghai, China. And you inject, uh, we use, um, into a hepato arterial injection so that the tumors will take up quickly um, the contrast agents first and you can map them within five minutes of injection uh, in the operating room. So basically this is what the surgeon could have seen and uh, was speculated to be the best case scenario. But we did see satellite, other kinds of uh, areas lighting up um, that ended up describing or showing that actually Yes, there were also these uh, disseminated lesions around the tumor in, in this patient. And so in addition to helping define boundaries, it will also be useful for exploring the surgical cavity or the tumor cavity to see if there are residual tumors somewhere around the area or the tissue and reset them correctly. And we have then in, in the case of ls one with our study is going undergoing um, this phase one clinical trials and, and it has passed the safety assessment. In fact, um, we thought we'd have needed um, higher dose to see this. And it's turning out that we don't even need to go higher. We may be sufficient, it may be sufficient to detect cancer at as small as 0.05 milligram per kilogram body weight. And, and that's very exciting for us to see. Um, then uh, you can then look at the tissue after resection. There's something I will show you next, we call the box that allows you to quickly, uh, within a few 
but when I scan through the whole tissue, be able to see the uh, orientation of the tumors and then look at in the pathology lab, follow it through to see if we can correlate the LS301 uptake with the cancer, which is clearly shown here. The bread loaf tissue along this axis allows you to see where the tumor is and which correlated with the whole tumor um, imaging that showed us if it's positive or negative. Interestingly, you can also visualize the tumors non-invasively. And here is a breast cancer patient uh, that before uh, surgery began after LS301, and then we use the cancer goggles and you can quickly visualize where the tumor is. So this can provide a guide to surgeons uh, as they try to localize the incision areas. And this could become one exciting way to do it even before incision and then follow it through uh, to complete resection. Well, one of the problems you quickly notice is that how do you know that the signal you are seeing is from deep or from uh, the superficial area? And that's a major issue with optical imaging methods. And here is a tumor that uh, if you look at the signal, whether it's coming here, complete precession is this way or that way. But, but the projection of the image that you are seeing whether it's low concentration that's at the top or high concentration that's in the middle, uh, well deep into the tissue, they all will project this way. And that's hard then, um, if you are looking at DCIS, Dr. Casinoma in situ here, you are interested in seeing the depth, um, two millimeter gap of safe clear margin. How do we do it with optical devices? And so to address that, we've come up with two simple methods that's now useful in the clinical room, uh, operating room, is to use the tissue as its own filter of depth. And to accomplish that, what we've done is to do either dual excitation, taking these two wavelengths, uh, you excite at two wavelengths and see the emission, or you take the ratio of the two emission in the near infrared window one and near infrared window two, to be able to ratio it and then remove concentration artifacts and only focus on depth. And that's what we've done. Um, if you look at this, at uh, two different concentrations with the same wavelength, we see different attenuation pattern. But when we take the ratio of the two excitation wavelengths, and this work is led by Christine O'Brien, and, and you quickly find that um, we normalize that, take it out and see the depth perception, uh, the depth uh, where the fluorescent is coming from. Uh, without much problem. So we've developed what we call the box. I hope you'll find a better name for it soon and integrated um, uh, the optical properties of, um, of tissue, in this case, breast that we're interested in, which then allows us to get linearity up to the two millimeter, uh, three millimeter level without distortion of the, uh, of the linearity of this. And, and that will help us at least for DCIS cases where you need two millimeter clear margin, we can tell you if the signal is coming below or, 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 or the two millimeter threshold or not, and then define positive uh, margin positivity based on that. We've also built a new device, uh, Leo Shmuelovich, uh, who is leading this for us uh, in terms of that with Shao, uh, Shio, uh, Shu, who now has developed an automatic system that can scan in the near infrared window one and two and quickly take that ratio that allows us then to look at the distance dependence of the signal we are obtaining. All these things are put together to allow us to, to see through that. And then finally, I just want to highlight uh, the point we are making is that we want this to be a global device that can be used anywhere in the world, uh, rich and low resource areas with no regard to where they are. And so if you break the components of the goggles apart, you quickly uh, notice that we can really simplify that whole system in such a way that um, uh, the illumination part, we can use LEDs that are very cheap. The, in terms of the beam splitters, we can use IR mirrors that are, again, uh, very cheap devices. Uh, the camera, the Raspberry Pi has come to life today. High schoolers enjoy using it. We've joined the high schoolers in adopting it into our own imaging systems um, is less than $25. Uh, uh, this is really exciting. And of course, it has its own board, the Raspberry Pi board that we turn into our computing device and it's sufficient enough to do that for us. 
So with the display systems, we have different ways of doing it. This will reduce the cost and make it affordable uh, to different uh, 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 clinical centers. Um, as you will see here, putting all of these together, you can, uh, instead of using the whole laser diode setup, uh, we can just tear them apart and collect the lasers and discard all the bulk around it because we can fix it in into a whole system. And then we have this uh, beam splitter device that we can intercept and mount directly multiple LEDs uh, into the system to make it very simple and easy to wear and integrate it. And so the final outcome of this new device that now we are launching in and we are going to be using uh, for our clinical studies moving forward is a system that you can see has these uh, uh, all aligned light source that always track each other and co-aligned with the camera setting that is right inside here and it can be mounted directly on the, uh, on the uh, on head mounted uh, display systems. And that mounting into this head mounted display system allows students to have the surgeon to have absolute control of what's going on. Um, whether you move your, your head forward or backwards, it can be done. Because of the ability to take away the processing from the camera down using this cable device, now we can shift the weight along the axis of the head in such a way that it's not weighing in front or in back, but distributed equally and processed in real time. So um, these are the devices and the approaches we are using in our system to make a surgery um, a more intuitive and objective. And um, we've developed these um, cancer viewing glasses that allows uh, real-time uh, fluorescent guidance in the operating room. Um, we will really uh, improve the whole feedback loop based on what the uh, surgeons are telling us and moving from one form to another. And we've also established the dual wavelength and dual excitation um, uh, systems that enable the depth mapping, which is a major problem in the operating room, but this simple approach really cost, uh, cut cost and makes it simpler to use. And then um, we've also come up with a low cost device now that we make it affordable to everyone. And moving forward, we're incorporating the deep learning pathway into it that will allow us to have all the information of the patient integrated into the system. Then that we allow uh, machine learning information and they guide the surgeons uh, throughout uh, during uh, practical applications. I know my time is up here, but I, I, I won't have time to, I, to talk about how we are now taking all that information to treat cancer. And it involves switching the wavelength of light to a different wavelength that then allows even the microscopic lesions you may not be able to see visually to be eradicated uh, in real time during surgery. So um, we, 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 the future is bright for us and, and we really hope that we can be able to change the paradigm on how these uh, uh, cancer tissues are being detected and to take it to a point of care settings. Um, with that, I want to thank um, a lot of our funding agencies that support this work in one form or another. And I thank you for your attention and I welcome any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Sam. That was that was great, and I learned a lot uh, myself. Um, we are um, please uh, put your questions in the Q and A, um, and I have a couple of questions, uh, Sam. One of the things that uh, I think you know the imaging gr groups in general struggle with is the is the depth that the tumor is at. It, it could be at the surface. It could be deep. Um, and in general, uh, given that uh, optical is, is very uh, variable in terms of how the, the scale, uh, just like in a photograph, you can you know, make it very bright or you can make it all dark. Uh, the same thing is true for these images that they can be scaled that way. Um, and the, the way that you propose to do it is, is to use a, a difference between the two uh, excitation wavelengths. Um, and I'm curious if you've been able to show that that correlates 
with a specific depth. In other words, as you look at the histology, that you're that that you're actually able to measure that to the millimeter, uh, in terms of uh, verifying that 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 that, 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 that has the accuracy to do that. Um, and then, is it real time or is it more black box based imaging? Yeah, very excellent questions. I, I think um, uh, it's it's not accurate to 0 0.001. Um, it, within the two millimeter range, we have a accuracy of plus or minus 0 0.2 millimeters. And, and that to us is sufficient at least to give a global information about that. Um, it's still new. Uh, we've not been able to um, um, require, we have not been able to explore more like different types of breast tissue. And I think we need to collect more data to do it. But what we like about this technology or this approach is the simplicity of that. And in terms of time, this can be done within a minute um, because um, the whole system that's now the new updated version that's been optimate, uh, 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 automated will allow the system to take the tissue and turn them around in the operating room and grab the images from different lens. Remember, we are not doing imaging and we are just doing um, a point uh, assessment of that. And so that's much faster and easier to scan than trying to image the whole tissue. Um, it's still early, um, but we really want to help solve that huge problem. Um, and then there's a question um, that I think is, of course, very challenging for all of us, but uh, Nathaniel Gray is asking, uh, what are the clinical endpoints required to establish that fluorescent guided surgery is um, aiding a better outcome? Um, that's a very yeah. good one. I, I, I think um, we started with breast cancer just because of that question. We know what the numbers are for positive margins at Washington University, it's about 15.5%. Um, so our goal, the only way to demonstrate endpoint is how much we reduce that recurrence uh, by using this technology. And we've pegged ours as reducing it from 15.5 to 5, less than 5%. And because this is a measurable outcome, it becomes easier for us to know if this made any improvement or not moving forward. So, and, and I would also say that there, uh, there were several, uh, you know, combined sessions with the FDA and the NCI. Um, the last one in, in, there was one in 2017 and the last one, 2018, uh, Sam and I uh, led. And basically the FDA recognized that if you could change positive margin uh, rates, you did not have to show full survival. So um, the ability to show a reduction in something that is known to correlate with poor outcome was sufficient uh, to demonstrate clinical benefit. And that is going to be uh, the bar, uh, I, I think, is that with uh, not just you know being able to recognize them, but showing that you have a reduced rate of positive margins in patients. Um, so, <clears throat> so I think I that's mean, that is good. very great. And, uh, and I thank you for your leadership in that area, uh, because I think um, that will help overcome the challenge of waiting for um, outcome in terms of survival and the rest, because we know how long that takes to even get enough number to do that. And then, um, yeah, so, and then the other question is, is, um, is there any uh, safety issues with the goggles as people are looking around and that the that the laser excitation sources can, is it, how do you manage that? Absolutely very good. And that's why if you look at the laser, because that's a very legitimate question, not just people looking around, also reflections uh, that could occur um, when you are using any laser light. First and foremost, we are using very low powered lasers for this, um, less than five milliwatts uh, for our applications. And then the second point is that, um, we angled the lasers in such a way that um, the only time is shooting up is, even if the surgeon is standing straight, it's not pointing directly to people around, it's always pointing downwards. 
And so that avoids that direct interaction with other people's eyes. Um, we're implementing what we call the shut off system that even if the surgeon decides to leave the, his or her head off, um, it automatically shuts off when he's looking parallel uh, uh, to the patient or to the, to the wearer. And so we've incorporated some of the safety measures to avoid that effect. That and how long, how long is, the, is the battery life on something like that? Like how long can the operation be? Oh, that's a very good one um, because initially we started with very inefficient batteries, which, which was a nightmare because um, uh, the laser we were using was just burning off the battery within uh, 15 minutes, you, you are done. Uh, you need to switch to the next battery. And what we found was by switching to laser diodes, we are consuming much less power. And we just have these big backup batteries right, right now that can last for up to an hour during surgery, um, but we hope to improve it based on the quality of batteries we, we have. I see, and, and when do you figure um, that, that, a that some kind of agent and device will be commercialized? Like what's your timeline for that? When do you think we'll expect to see these in patients uh, um, as a commercial product? Yeah, the agents I think is moving fast. Now, I mean, we've already, um, going to study phase two clinical trials. Um, and as you know very well, it takes a lot of time to get through that. Uh, we hope that with the uh, extending it to other clinical centers, we'll be able to accelerate the process. Um, the, it's been licensed now, LS301 has been licensed by a company, as you know, those of us in academia, uh, we don't do a very good job at that point. And so, um, uh, a company has been formed to take this um, uh, to commercialization. And the second one, it, uh, cancer goggles also has been licensed. Um, and I think um, people, other centers may start using it just as a, um, as a uh, research device for a little while until it goes through all required FDA approval. But because it's non-contact, I don't expect that to take too long. Um, it's a device that is non-contact, and so that helps us. Well, good. Well, um, I think we're I think we're about out of town. If uh, excuse me, out of time. Uh, I am out of town, but also we're out of time, and you are out of town. Um, but anyway, so so thank you so much for coming and 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 sharing that with us. Um, it has been it has been really great to have somebody of your stature willing to to come give an hour. So so thank you very much, Sam. Very thank much you a it. lot, and thanks for the invitation. Thank you, everyone. Yep. All right. Bye bye. Bye.